In March of 2013, nine-year-old Jade Howe sat in the nurse's office at her elementary school in Kona, Hawaii. It was the annual vision screening at her school, and Jade was busy telling the visiting optometrist all about the cupcake her mom packed her for lunch and how excited she was for hula dancing class after school. The optometrist laughed and asked Jade to sit up straight so he could examine her. Jade straightened her back and smiled as the optometrist dimmed the lights and then shined a flashlight into her left eye. Right away, Jade flinched. The light made her head hurt a little, but then her eyes adjusted. She was used to eye exams. She had worn glasses for most of her life, so she knew what to expect. Normally, she would just read charts on the wall while the optometrist gave her different lenses to try. But today was different. She'd had a headache off and on all morning, and her vision felt blurred, like everything was fuzzy around the edges. So it was harder than usual for her to read all those charts. The optometrist clicked his tongue a few times like he was thinking through a problem, and Jade got the feeling that something might be wrong. Just as Jade was about to ask if everything was okay, the optometrist handed her a black plastic spatula and told her to use it to cover up her right eye. Then the doctor held up a sheet of paper with rows of letters on it and asked her to read the lines aloud using just her left eye. But when Jade put that spatula over her right eye, her vision from her left eye became so blurred that she could barely see anything at all. She lowered the spatula and inspected it as if the spatula was to blame. But when she saw no issue with the spatula, she just put it right back over her right eye, but again, she could barely see out of her left eye. She asked the optometrist what happened to her left eye, but the optometrist just scribbled on a pink notepad and ripped off the paper, and he handed it to Jade and told her to give it to her parents the moment she got home from school. That afternoon, when school let out, Jade ran to her mother, Ho Ola'i Berman, who was standing on the sidewalk waiting for her. Jade immediately handed her mother the optometrist's report and watched a worried look come over her face as she read it. Jade asked her mom if something was wrong with her eyes, but her mom just smiled and told her not to worry. They'd schedule an appointment with the optometrist when they got home. Jade very likely just needed new glasses. Jade felt very relieved and just nodded, and then she shifted her focus and just began digging through her backpack for her lunchbox. She had saved a fruit roll-up for the walk home. Usually, Jade and her mother would stop at a park near their house to play and unwind after school, but today, when they got to that park, Jade didn't really feel like playing. She still had a headache and she could barely see out of her left eye, so she ended up just sitting in the sandbox eating her snack. Jade was absentmindedly digging in the sand when a dog wandered over to say hello. She had seen this dog before. It was a stray, and it was a little scraggly looking, but it was always friendly, and Jade knew it loved belly rubs. And so after a few minutes of playing, the dog wandered off to a garbage can to look for food, and then Jade's mom came over and sat down beside Jade and asked her how she was feeling. Jade didn't answer. She just leaned over and put her aching head in her mother's lap. She was relieved when she heard her mom say that it was time to go home. A few days later, Jade's mother, Ho Ola'i, sat in the corner of an optometrist's office watching him finish up Jade's eye exam. The optometrist switched off the lights and smiled at Jade, and then said he'd actually like to take some x-rays. Jade's mom was a little surprised, but agreed to any extra cost if it helped her daughter see. The optometrist took the x-rays right there in his office, and 15 minutes later, they all gathered around his computer screen, looking at the enlarged images of Jade's left eye. To Jade and her mother, the image they were looking at just kind of looked like a big grape with veins running through it, but the optometrist immediately pointed at a small black mass located on the retina at the back of Jade's left eye. He was certain that this black mass was causing Jade's vision loss. The retina's job is to focus the eye, and so the mass was clearly getting in the way. But he wasn't sure what the mass was. The best thing to do was treat it like an infection and start Jade on antibiotics. Then they could see if that cleared it up and go from there. On the car ride home, Jade complained that her headache was back. Her mom sighed and said that it sounded like something only ice cream could fix. Jade smiled and started bouncing with excitement in her seat. Ho Ola'i laughed as she started driving towards the nearest ice cream shop, convinced that her daughter would feel better in a few days. But after a week, Jade was not feeling any better. Her head still hurt, and she could barely see out of her left eye. So her mom called the optometrist, who told her it was time for them to go see a doctor who has a specialty in these types of issues. 
The next morning, Jade's mom sat beside her dad, Jack, in the eye specialist's office. Jade curled up on her father's lap, playing a game on his phone while they waited for test results and x-rays. A moment later, a stout man in a lab coat walked into the office and sat on a stool opposite Jade and her parents. He pulled the stool closer to his desk, pulling Jade's x-rays up on his computer screen and flipping through a clipboard on his desk. He told Jade's parents that the antibiotics had not cleared up the black mass on Jade's eye. Then he pointed to the dark spot on Jade's x-ray. The doctor explained that the mass behind Jade's eye appeared to be inflamed, and when he compared the x-ray taken that morning to the x-ray taken last week, the mass really seemed to be growing bigger, which meant that Jade's sight loss would likely only get worse. Her headaches might become more severe too, and if the mass got too swollen, Jade could lose all sight in that eye. Jade's mom suddenly felt a lump in her throat as she asked the doctor what could be done. The doctor looked over at Jade with a hint of pity on his face, and then he said that he'd like to try injecting steroids directly into the mass, which would hopefully reduce the swelling and clear up the mass completely. It was a scary sounding procedure, he said, but it would be done with anesthesia and it would only take a minute. And once it was over, Jade really should be cured. Jade would have this procedure done, but two days later, when Jade and her mother, Ho Ola'i, returned for a follow-up appointment, the specialist walked into the examination room with a glum expression on his face, and he told them that the injection had not worked. And worse than that, he said he was out of ideas. They were going to have to find a new doctor. And so over the next few weeks, Jade and her mother visited three other eye specialists, but none of them could figure out what was causing this black mass on Jade's left eye either. Jade's mother was really frustrated and very upset. She remembered what the first specialist had said about her daughter potentially losing all the sight in her eye, and so now she felt like if they didn't find an answer soon, it would just be too late. By the time Jade and her mother found themselves waiting anxiously in the exam room of the most experienced eye doctors on the island, it had been almost three months since Jade's eye began to hurt and both Jade and Ho Ola'i were fighting a growing feeling of hopelessness. Jade's mom would never give up on her daughter, but she was tired and scared. The door finally opened, and a tall man with short black hair and a prominent chin strode inside. His name was Dr. Eugene Ng, and he was a retina surgeon. He squatted down in front of Jade and asked her gently if he could look at her eyes. Jade smiled and nodded and let go of her mother's hand. Her mother felt relief rise in her chest. She liked Dr. Ng immediately, and it was clear Jade did too. But as Dr. Ng shined a flashlight into Jade's eyes and conducted a few quick tests, Jade's mother tried to tamp down her optimism. This was the same thing every other doctor had done, and when Dr. Ng clicked off his flashlight and stood up, she braced herself to hear him say, well, there's nothing we can do, go find another doctor. But, unlike all the other eye specialists, Dr. Ng said he was fairly certain he knew what was wrong with her eye. Jade's mother could barely believe this. She smiled and let herself hope, just for a second, that finally her daughter would get the help she needed. But then she realized that Dr. Ng was not smiling back at her. Instead, he looked almost grim as he told her that while he could diagnose Jade's problem, nobody in all of Hawaii had the expertise to actually fix it. Jade needed immediate medical attention that was not available on the islands so she would have to be flown to the mainland of the United States as soon as possible. A week later, Jade sat with her mother in the back of an Uber that was driving them from the Los Angeles International Airport to their hotel. Jade watched the other cars on the highway blur past and noticed how beige and concrete everything looked in Southern California compared to the lush green of Hawaii. Jade was really missing her father. Jack had had to stay home in Hawaii to work, and he was also going to miss Jade's birthday, which was in two days. Jade dreaded the idea of turning 10 without her father around, and she also dreaded seeing another specialist that afternoon. Even though her left eye was now completely blurry and her headaches had only been getting worse, Jade was scared of going to see another doctor. She was afraid that whatever treatment they would give her would be more painful and more uncomfortable than what she was already experiencing. But Jade tried to push her worry from her mind. 
After all, she was in the city where all her favorite movies were made. Her mom had even promised her that they could go do some sightseeing when they weren't at the doctor's office. And so Jade decided she was just going to have fun on this trip no matter what. That afternoon, Jade sat in another examination chair, this time at the Children's Retina Institute in Los Angeles. A doctor with red hair and a neatly trimmed beard was drawing blood samples from Jade's arm while Jade told him all about the last time she'd been poked with a needle and how much it had hurt. The doctor's name was Dr. Khaled Tawanzi, and Jade's mother had told Jade that he was actually the one who started this institute. Jade watched the blood flow from her arm down through a plastic tube and into small vials. It didn't hurt at all, and Jade actually found it fascinating to watch. She asked Dr. Tawanzi what he was going to do with her blood, and he smiled at her. He explained that he'd send her blood to a very special laboratory where scientists would run all kinds of tests. Then, in a day or two, they'd know for sure if Dr. Ng was right about what was causing the blindness in her left eye. Jade imagined an all-white laboratory full of shiny machines and scientists in blue scrubs. She'd seen something like that in a movie once. It made her feel safe, like the best doctors in Los Angeles would be working to save her vision. Dr. Tawanzi told Jade that in the meantime, her very important assignment was to have as much fun in Los Angeles as possible. Jade smiled as her mom assured him that they had plenty of plans for that. Two days later, Jade peered over the side of a tour trolley, watching a shark's fin move through a man-made pool set to the iconic Jaws movie soundtrack. It was her 10th birthday, and her mother had taken her to Universal Studios Hollywood. Just as the music reached a crescendo, an animatronic shark came leaping out of the water. Jade leaped back from the edge of the trolley, and then she laughed and clapped with the rest of the tour group. By the time Jade and her mother got off the trolley a few minutes later, Jade felt better than she had in a long time. For just a moment, she had forgotten all about her troubles. She decided it was birthday magic. As she led her mother away from the studio's tour, Jade heard her mother's cell phone ring. She turned to look at her mom, and Ho Ola'i dug through her purse, pulled out her phone. She looked at the caller ID and asked Jade to wait a minute. It was Dr. Tawanzi calling. Jade sat down on a nearby green plastic bench while her mom paced and listened. Jade watched as the smile on her mother's face faded. Jade's stomach lurched. She knew that whatever news her mother was receiving, it could not be good. Jade swung her legs nervously as her mother hung up with the doctor and then made a second phone call, which was much shorter. And when her mother turned around, Jade could tell she was extremely upset. Ho Ola'i strode over and sat on the bench next to her daughter. Jade held her breath as her mom explained what the doctor had told her. Jade needed surgery. Jade felt tears well up in her eyes as she asked her mother if the surgery would actually save her eyesight. Her mom frowned and struggled to find the right words. Finally, she explained that they didn't know if this procedure could actually save her eyesight. But without the surgery, it was fairly likely that she could lose her entire left eye. If that happened, she would have to have a glass eye instead. Jade tried to picture the doctor cutting out her eye and what it would feel like with a glass ball in her eye socket. The very thought of it sent tears running down her face and she turned to her mom and sobbed into her chest. The next morning, Jade's mother stood next to Jade's gurney at the Children's Retina Institute. Jade looked frightened and kept looking around for her father, who had gotten on the first plane available to come join them. Jack was supposed to have landed more than an hour ago, and Jade's mother was worried he would miss the surgery. Ho Ola'i squeezed her daughter's hand as Dr. Tawanzi propped open the double doors that led to the operating room. He asked Jade if she was ready, and her mother beamed proudly as Jade nodded her head bravely. Then they heard a commotion down the hall. They all turned to see Jade's dad, Jack, burst into the hallway and run toward the gurney. When Jack reached them, he leaned down and planted a big kiss on Jade's forehead. He whispered in Jade's ear, happy birthday, and that he loved her. Finally, a nurse said it was time to take Jade into surgery, and so Ho Ola'i and Jack both blew kisses at their daughter as she was rolled into the operating room. The parents held each other as they watched the doors swing closed. It all felt so unfair. Their daughter was barely 10 years old, and she might lose her eye. And now, all they could do was wait and hope. In the operating room, Dr. Tawanzi waited until Jade was completely asleep before using a speculum, which is like a small vice grip, to pry open her left eyelid. 
Once her eyelid was propped open, Dr. Tawanzi began the careful process of removing Jade's eye completely from its socket so that only the optical nerve was connecting it to her body. Once Dr. Tawanzi had freed Jade's eyeball from its socket, he held it up and turned it around until he was looking at the back. He had seen scans of the mass on Jade's eye, but he was still shocked by how it looked in person. It was a thick, dark mass, and it was caked on so hard it felt like a rock. Dr. Tawanzi could tell it was going to be extremely difficult to remove it without permanently injuring Jade's eye, because the doctor knew there was a risk that this mass was not just on Jade's eye, it might be embedded inside of Jade's eye. And if that was the case, Jade would very likely lose her eye entirely, no matter what Dr. Tawanzi did. But Dr. Tawanzi would not know how bad this was until he attempted to remove it. It took Dr. Tawanzi nearly three hours to remove this foreign mass from Jade's eyeball, slowly pulling it off one tiny piece at a time. It almost felt like he was tearing cardboard with each pull. But finally, with one last gentle pull, the last of the black lump dislodged. Dr. Tawanzi placed it all on a dish, and a nurse whisked it away for testing. Then he lifted Jade's eyeball with his forceps and slid it back into the socket, hoping it could be saved. The first thing Jade saw when she woke up was her parents' smiling faces. However, she only saw them through her right eye. A protective patch was covering her left eye following the surgery. Jade felt groggy, but she was so relieved to see her parents, especially her dad, who told her she looked so cool like a pirate. But then Jade began to panic as she touched her patch and wondered if she still even had an eye behind it. Was there a glass eyeball now? But her mom took Jade's hand and told her, don't worry, she still had her eye. Dr. Tawanzi was able to save it. Jade smiled huge with relief. Her mom was crying and told Jade what a great job she did. A few moments after that, Dr. Tawanzi walked into the recovery room. Jade and her family grinned and thanked him for his help. But Dr. Tawanzi said they were not out of the woods yet. He told Jade and her parents that Dr. Ng had been right about his diagnosis. Jade's condition was much more dangerous than anything doctors in Hawaii could treat, and the surgery was not a guaranteed solution. Because Jade's eyeball had been invaded by living creatures. The creatures, he said, were parasites called Toxicara, otherwise known as roundworm. Dr. Tawanzi explained that usually Toxicara is spread through dog feces. He asked if Jade had a pet dog at home. Jade said no, but then she told Dr. Tawanzi about the stray dog that she sometimes played with at the local park. Dr. Tawanzi nodded and said that it was very possible to pick up Toxicara at a park frequented by stray dogs or even just by pets and their owners. All it would take for Jade to get this infection would be for her to touch a tiny bit of dirt with dog feces on it and then touch her mouth. Toxicara is not rare. In fact, they are one of the most common parasites in the world. About 5% of American adults have antibodies in them that show they have been exposed at some point in their lives to Toxicara. But most people who ingest Toxicara eggs don't get a single symptom and never even know the parasite was inside of them at all. Typically, the body forms a hard shell around the parasite and expels through the intestines. But in some cases, the body is too slow to react and the parasites migrate through the body and end up in organs like the liver, kidneys, and sometimes even the eyes. And that's what had happened to Jade. She had developed a very rare condition called ocular toxocariasis. In ocular toxocariasis, the body does finally form that protective shell around the parasites, but only after the parasites have attached themselves to the eye. That's why the mass on the back of Jade's eye was so hard. Her body was trying to protect her, just a little too late. Jade got lucky. Her body's response had come in time to stop the parasites before they completely destroyed her eye. And Dr. Tawanzi was pretty sure he managed to remove every last parasite from her body. Still, he told Jade and her parents that she would have to be watched very closely in the days ahead to make sure he had not missed any. Most of Dr. Tawanzi's explanation went way over Jade's head. But she grimaced at the disgusting thought of accidentally eating dog poop, and Dr. Tawanzi actually laughed a little bit when he saw Jade's face. 
He told her it's much more common than you think. Just make sure you always wash your hands after the playground and you'll be okay. Jade grinned as a wave of relief washed over her. She was ready to be done with doctor's offices and dog poop. A few days later, the family all flew back home to Hawaii. Jade's eyesight in her left eye would come back. However, it really never fully recovered. But other than her vision, she would be okay. Jade would go on to be a cheerleader for her high school, and she would also continue to dance hula. In 1995, 37-year-old Jeannie Hesselschwert was living with her fiancé, Mike Monahan in Arlington, Massachusetts. The couple had been together for 10 years, and their family said they really loved each other and they were a great couple. In July of that year, Jeannie and Mike left for a planned trip to Yosemite National Park in California to go backpacking and sightseeing. On July 9th, the couple arrived at Yosemite, and they entered via this road that was only open during the summer. So as such, it was totally desolate, and they were the only ones on this road. And they had about a two, two and a half hour drive until they reached the spot they were going to actually stop at. So they had the scenic drive up the road. And about two hours into this drive, there was this turnout on the side of the road where a couple of other tourists were standing and sightseeing. And Jeannie and Mike decided they wanted to pull over and get out and stretch their legs. So they pulled over in the turnout. And when they got out, Mike said he wanted to walk down the trail a little ways to this area that apparently was good for bird watching. And Jeannie didn't want to do that. She wanted to walk in the other direction up to this overlook. And so they decided that they would each get to do their own activities. They'd be gone for 15 minutes and then meet back at the car. So Mike heads down and does his bird watching. And then after 15 minutes, he walks back up to the car expecting to see Jeannie, but she's not there. And this is 1995, neither of them had a cell phone. And so he can't just call her. And so he just stands by the car and waits. And so he's looking around waiting for her to reemerge out of the trail she had left on. But after 15 more minutes goes by and he still hasn't seen her, he walks up to some of the tourists that were there in the first place and he asks them, hey, have you seen this woman, Jeannie? And he described what she looked like. And they said, no, we haven't seen her. And so he goes back to the car and now he's getting pretty anxious and he's looking around and he's just waiting for her to show up. And another 15 minutes goes by. So now she's 30 minutes late and he starts walking up the trail to see if he can find her. But he realizes the trail immediately spiders off in different directions. And so she could have gone in any one of these different pathways. And so at this point he decides, I have to get authorities involved. Time is of the essence. And so he runs back to his car and he sees a park service employee emptying a trash can into a dumpster. Her. And so he runs over to them and he says, you know, my fiance, Jeannie, she's gone. She's been gone for 30 minutes. Can you please get in touch with authorities and get people up here looking for her? Within 45 minutes of speaking to this employee, park rangers had made their way up to this area and they began talking to Mike and figuring out where she might have gone. And they start walking down the trail to look for her. But after an hour of not finding her, the park rangers would call in additional assistance from the police. The search for Jeannie would become the largest in Yosemite's history, expanding to 40 square miles with helicopters overhead and dog handlers on the ground and hundreds of volunteers combing this whole area. But despite the relatively quick response time and massive amount of manpower, they could not find Jeannie. After two weeks of looking everywhere for her, the only thing they were able to find were two boot prints that they believed belonged to Jeannie. The first print was found in the vicinity of where their car was parked, so where she had actually disappeared from. And then the other one was curiously located on a trail that was one of the biggest trails in Yosemite. It was very well marked. It was fairly wide. You're not going to mistake this for anything other than a trail. And the boot print was not walking along the trail. It was cutting across it as if she was going from woodline crossing over the trail into the other woodline. This second print didn't make any sense to authorities because they're thinking, you know, if you're lost out in the middle of the woods and you come across a clearly defined trail, a really obvious, obvious trail, you wouldn't walk across it and go back into the woods. You would take the trail in either direction until it hits civilization because all trails do that for the most part. And so it seemed like this print could not be hers because that would indicate she has chosen not to follow this path. But the print was hers. Over the course of these two weeks of searching, several dog teams had been placed right where Mike's car had been, right where Jeannie had left to go to the trail where she disappeared. And the dogs could not pick up a scent of Jeannie. And it led the handlers to believe that Mike was actually lying and that Jeannie had actually never been in Yosemite. And this was all a big ploy because he had done something to her and he was gonna act like she's lost in the wilderness and he was gonna get away with whatever he did to her. And so ultimately the FBI got involved 
because now foul play is being suggested. And the first thing the FBI did is they polygraphed Mike. And he passed without question, and he was totally vindicated of any involvement. After that, the FBI dug into Mike's background and Jeannie's background to see if there was any indication of somebody that might want to do Jeannie harm, and they couldn't find anything. She was just gone, and nobody knew what happened to her. On September 3rd, so two months after Jeannie went missing, two men were in this really remote section of Yosemite to go fishing when they spotted a human body in a pool of water it would turn out to be Jeannie's. She was three miles from where she was last seen by Mike at that trailhead. She was only wearing socks and one boot, and she had been sitting in this pool of water for so long that they were unable to determine a cause of death. Initially, it was speculated that she must have fallen into the river that fed ultimately down to where she was found. She must have fallen into that river, you know, miles away, close to where she went missing. Maybe she fell and hit her head and was unconscious, and then she drowned, and then she wound up here. But park officials said there's too many debris along this waterway that her body would never have been able to get down to this spot. But if she didn't drift to that spot, it meant she had to have gotten there on foot. And to get to this particular spot, according to the fishermen that were interviewed after they found her, the only way to get there is to climb up a cliff with climbing gear on or scale down a cliff again with climbing gear on. The only people that go fishing in this area are mountain climbers and rock climbers that have the equipment to get there. From where Jeannie went missing, she would have had to climb down 2,000 feet of cliff face to get to this spot, and she did not have climbing gear. And so when that seemed really unlikely, the next theory was, okay, she must have been abducted, and, and they brought her here. But that means your assailant would have had to carry genie down this 2000 foot cliff which also seems really unrealistic the most widely accepted theory was put forth by a tracker that was involved in this case they went out and they surveyed the area where genie would have been and they noticed that the sound the wind made when it passed by this particular clump of aspen trees when the wind hit the leaves in the trees it sounded like a car driving by. And so they speculated that maybe, you know, Jeannie, she's scared, you know, she's panicking, it's nighttime, and she hears this sound and she thinks she's hearing a road. And so she would have walked towards the sound of, you know, the car, which really was the leaves, and she would have disregarded, for example, the trail. She would have walked over the trail because she's trying to get down to this road. She's kind of fixated on this road. And at some point, she could have potentially wound up at the side of that cliff that would have led down to where she was found. And then she could have slipped and fallen over the edge and landed in one of the rivers that would have flowed down to where she was found. But park officials and authorities were a little bit skeptical of this theory because for her to have landed in a stretch of water that did connect to where she was found, it was almost like she would have had to leap off the cliff to land in that stretch of water. It wouldn't have been just falling over the edge and then you're landing in this water. It would have been more of a jump to get to it. So the idea that, you know, Jeannie is running and leaping off cliffs, that doesn't really add up either. But park officials and authorities, they don't have a better theory. In fact, no one has a better theory. We're just left with a lot of questions like, how did she wind up in this inaccessible area? Why didn't the dogs pick up her scent? Why didn't she take that trail down to safety? Why did she cross over it? Unfortunately, we'll probably never know the answer. On September 19th, 2013, 69-year-old retired middle school teacher Amy Linkert and her friend, 63-year-old Joe Blakesley, who was a physician, headed off to the Craters on the Moon Park in Idaho. This park is actually a dormant volcano. It's not extinct. It's gonna be active again, probably in the next 1,000 years. But for now, it's this beautiful park that is known for these crazy lava fields that look otherworldly. You know, barely any vegetation can grow on them, and there's just a strip of, of pavement they've kind of weaved through these massive jagged lava fields. And then you have all these big mounds that are the actual volcanoes. Another feature of this park are all the lava tubes underground. All the molten lava, when it jets around underneath the surface before shooting out, it carves these natural tunnels underground, these huge caverns. They're like these big caves you can explore. And there's 1,100 miles of lava tubes, tunnels, and caves underneath this park. The two women told their families they would be back in Boise, Idaho by the 21st. But when the 21st came and they were not home, their families were suspicious. They tried calling them. They didn't pick up. 
And for the next 36 hours, they just kept trying to call them and, you know, called around to see if anybody else knew where they were. And then finally, on the morning of the 23rd, when no one knew where they were, they reached out to the authorities. The formal search for these two women began on the 24th, so five days after they had initially left for this trip. And the searchers quickly found their pickup truck parked in the parking lot of the craters on the moon park. And in their truck were their two dogs who were alive, they were okay. And in the front seat were their purses and their cell phones, but there was no sign of Amy or Joe. This was obviously a bad sign. And so the search was really kicked into high gear to see if they could find these women before it was too late. But unfortunately, within 24 hours of finding the truck, they would find Amy's body and her body was located way off of the main trail. She was in an area that the park superintendent described as incredibly rugged and inaccessible. Now at this park, there is a strip of cement that weaves through this really dangerous lava field. And if you were on this strip of cement, you wouldn't be thinking about walking onto the lava field. Not only would you need to navigate all these massive mounds of jagged, cooled lava, there's all these cracks in the ground that you could fall through and just plummet to your death. So no one's about to start walking off the trail, especially not two older women that went here just to have a casual stroll through the park. They were not there for some grand adventure. They were not athletic distance hikers. It made no sense that Amy would be so far off the trail in an area that was so dangerous and so clearly off limits. When the families were notified that Amy had been found and they were still looking for Joe, the detail that the family keyed in on was the idea that these two women left their dogs in the truck. That was something so unbelievably uncharacteristic of either of them. They adored those two dogs. They would never, ever abandon them like that. In fact, because of that detail, the families jumped to this has to be foul play because they never would have done that. They wouldn't have abandoned these precious dogs. The search for Joe would continue. They basically shifted the entire effort to center over Amy where she was found and work in circles out from there to see if they could find her. They had helicopters flying overhead. They had mining experts walking through all the lava tubes below and they couldn't find her. Finally, on October 23rd, so 28 days after Amy was found, Joe's body was discovered as well and she was lying one mile away from where Amy had been found in a similarly inaccessible part of the park that would have required significant climbing over jagged, cooled lava fields and all these cracks in the ground she would have had to navigate to reach where she was. And even more strangely is the area where she was found had been searched extensively by air with helicopter pilots flying overhead and by cadaver sniffing dogs that had been in that area and they had not picked up her scent. So either the helicopter pilots and the cadaver sniffing dogs were just wrong or missed something, or Joe had not been there the whole time. A cause of death has not been determined for either of the two women. However, what was released is neither of them appeared to have suffered an incapacitating injury, meaning they weren't struck down where they were. They were traveling and ultimately stopped where they were. It seems highly unlikely that these two women abandoned their two dogs and left their cell phones in the car and then wandered way off the trail and separated from each other all without supplies. But even if they had done that, even if they had, you know, separated and left the trail, where they ultimately reached seems like an area they would not have been able to get to without assistance. And since they were separated, they weren't able to help each other get where they were. So although authorities have ruled out foul play, this was deemed an accident, it does seem like if there was ever a place to commit an attack, it would be this particular park because underneath the park is 1100 miles of lava tubes that connect to each other and weave all through the park. And there's hundreds of caves, many of which have not been found or explored that it would be pretty straightforward to attack someone and then go underground and not be found. Certainly makes you wonder who or what could be hiding underground in those lava tubes. On March 7th, 1975, 21-year-old Mark Hansen, along with two of his friends from college, 
Ben Fish and John Chidester arrived at a parking lot on the eastern side of the Appalachian Trail. All three of the young men were in incredible physical shape and were excited to spend their spring break challenging themselves on some of the trail's most rigorous hikes. The day before they were supposed to go, they almost canceled the trip because there was this terrible weather system that was coming over the trail. And they were thinking, you know, it's going to be dangerous. It's not such a good idea. And then they started talking some more and they were like, well, we're already going to, you know, challenge ourselves. It would be even more challenging to hike these really difficult trails with the inclusion of bad weather. So this is another way to, you know, test our abilities. And so they kind of got pumped up at the idea of hiking the Appalachian Trail in terrible weather. So the guys arrive in the parking lot, you know, the windshield wipers are furiously working to keep the pouring rain off. They hop out and they're getting soaked by the rain. They put on their ponchos, they grab their heavy packs and they make their way over to the trail. Their plan was to move west along the trail until they hit the Tri-Corner Shelter where they would spend their first night. The Tri-Corner Shelter is one of the many shelters along the Appalachian Trail. They are open to the public. There's no heating or electricity but it provides shelter from the storm. You can go in there and, you know, get in a sleeping bag and you'll be fine. But to get to the Tri-Corner Shelter, they would need to hike 16 miles, almost completely uphill, walking right into the wind and it's raining on them and it's supposed to snow later on. So it's just a treacherous, treacherous first day. But they take off, they start walking up this trail. And after a couple of miles, John says, you know what, guys, this is awful. I think we should probably turn around. I think we've, we've underestimated how bad this is going to be. Let's go back to the car and we'll do this another time. But Mark and Ben were like, oh no, we are committed. We are doing this. We are not turning around. And John's like, you know what? Suit yourself. I'm not going to do that. And he turned around and he left and he went back to the car and he would pick them up when they were done. After John turned around, Mark and Ben, you know, they felt good, they felt tough. They're gonna stick this hike out. And so they take off again and Ben's in the lead and Ben seems to be handling the poor weather and difficult hike and heavy pack a lot better than Mark is. In fact, over the next several hours, Mark would drift farther and farther back and Ben would need to wait for him and Mark would be hunched over, you know, really just struggling with this hike. And then at some point, Mark yells to him and says, I got to take my pack off. I can't carry this much weight up this hill until we get to the shelter. I'm not going to make it to the shelter. And Ben would say to him, you know, if we don't get to the shelter for some reason, you're going to be stranded out here in this storm without any warm clothes, without your sleeping bag, without your tent, without your food, without your water. It's, it's way too dangerous. You have to keep your pack on. And so finally, Mark is convinced and he's like, oh, all right, puts his pack back on and they continue moving. About an hour later at 7 p.m., they had reached the section of the trail where they knew they were getting close-er, close-ish to the tri-corner shelter. They were certainly well beyond the halfway point, but it was dark out, the temperature had dropped significantly. At this point, Ben is basically Mark's cheerleader, kind of egging him on to keep moving, and Mark's kind of staggering along this trail, and Ben and Mark are just hoping that shelter just appears at some point here because they don't know how much farther they can go. Another hour and a half goes by, they still haven't made it to the shelter. Mark is groaning, he can barely move, it's pitch black, the rain has now completely shifted over to snow and it is just dumping snow on them. And Ben is concerned that, you know, somehow did we take a wrong turn, even though they were on a really well-marked trail and he, and he knew they hadn't. He figured they must be so close at this point. And it was around this time that Mark yells out to Ben, I'm done. I can't go any farther. And he sits down right in the middle of the trail. He's sitting down with his pack and he's just laying there. And Ben is like, come on, we're so close. You can't sit down now. And Mark's like, I'm not moving. I can't do any more. I'm going to sleep right here. Ben knows this is a bad idea. I mean, they did have warm clothes and sleeping bags and they probably would be just fine sleeping out in the middle of the trail. But it just seemed so unnecessarily risky when there's probably a shelter maybe a couple hundred meters away, and he would turn out to be right. And so he decides he's gonna walk ahead on the trail and he's gonna see if the shelter's there, but he only went about a hundred meters. He was within maybe a hundred meters of the actual shelter, but he never saw it. And so after going ahead and, and feeling like, man, I don't wanna drag Mark any farther, you know, if there's no shelter ahead, for all we know, we took a wrong turn. And so he turns back around and he goes back near Mark, not next to him, but close enough to him that he can see him. 
and he sits down on the trail too. He gets his sleeping bag out, he crawls inside, and he falls asleep. That night, Ben would have this vivid, horrible nightmare where he heard Mark screaming for help, yelling for Ben to come save him as he's being dragged off the trail into the forest. And it scared him so much that Ben woke up and he looks down the trail to where Mark is and he can see Mark's backpack is sitting right on the trail. And so he thinks, oh, Mark's still there. And he's so tired, he's not about to get up and go check. He's like, that was just a dream. And he goes back to sleep. The next morning when the sun comes up, Ben gets up again. And the first thing he does is he looks over at Mark and he sees the pack, but he realizes that Mark is not there. It's just the backpack. And so Ben jumps up and he yells for Mark. He doesn't get a response. He's looking around thinking he's gotta be around here, but he's not. It snowed that night. So any tracks Mark would have left to show where he went to were now covered up. And that's when it dawns on Ben that that dream he had the night before, that might've been real. And he has this sinking feeling that something horrible has happened to Mark and that he didn't save him. And so he thinks, I gotta get authorities. He grabs his bag. He leaves Mark's there because he's thinking maybe he'll come back and he'll grab it. And Ben turns and runs down the trail in the direction he hopes is towards this tri-corner shelter. And he can't believe it when literally 200 meters away, he finds the tri-corner shelter. They were that close. And inside are other hikers. He was able to get one of them to run down and get park services to know that they have a missing hiker on the trail. Searchers were dispatched to the area where Mark and Ben had been sleeping on the trail. The first thing they did is they went to his bag and inside were all the things he would need to survive out in the wild. His tent, his warm clothes, his sleeping bag, his food, his water, everything. It was all left there. Over the next few days, hundreds of searchers combed the area, they had helicopters overhead, and they made no significant discovery. However, one park ranger discovered this huge cave that was not that far away from where they had been sleeping. And inside of this cave, this ranger said a large mammal had been staying recently, it was not there now, and there was all these animal bones inside the cave. So it was obviously a predator of some kind. And so there was speculation that between this cave that probably held, you know, a bear or something like that, and Ben's dream that probably was reality of Mark being pulled off the trail screaming for help, that maybe Mark was attacked by some animal that dragged him away. On the ninth day of the search, Mark's body was found. It was located three miles down the hill from where he and Ben had been sleeping up on that trail. Mark was positioned up against a tree. His jacket was open, his gloves were off and his boots were off and they were placed right next to him. An autopsy concluded he must have died within 24 to 36 hours of leaving that trail. So there's lots of questions with this one, namely, why did Mark in the middle of the night get up, not tell Ben where he was going and then leave the trail and walk three miles away? The trail they were on was very well worn that even at night in a snowstorm, it would be very obvious if you were on the trail or if you were off the trail. If you look at this picture, this is a section of the trail they were on. This is not the literal place they were at, but this is a good representation. As you can clearly see, there is a trail that runs down the middle, and then there is the forest to the side of that trail. That if you were to leave the trail, you'd be bumping into trees left and right. It would be very obvious you were off the trail. So Mark had to have known he was leaving the trail. But even if Mark had a great reason for wanting to leave the trail, just hours earlier, he couldn't even stand. That's why they were even laying on the trail to begin with, because he couldn't go any farther. So the idea that he can just jump up in the middle of the night and navigate this really difficult terrain for three miles in total darkness in the snow, that doesn't make sense either. And then you have Ben's dream where he hears Mark screaming for help and he's yelling for Ben to come save him as he's getting dragged off the trail. There's a good chance what Ben was hearing and seeing in his dream was actually playing out just several feet away from him down the trail. So David Politis and the other people involved in the search they all believe the key to understanding what happened to Mark is what caused him to scream for help and potentially what pulled him off the trail and dragged him three miles.
miles away. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please befriend the like button. And when they give you their phone for you to enter your number in, go ahead and Venmo yourself a thousand dollars and then give them their phone back. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate